him. God reigns supreme, but chooses to work in partnership with each one of us. Our part is to pray and obey. He hears and answers, but without prayer, nothing is accomplished. God has no limits, but we can limit him with our lack of faith. <coughs> Hebrews 4 tells us to come boldly before the throne of grace, to obtain mercy and to find grace to help in time of need. This morning, uh, we want to, the Lord wants us to pray and intercede for Ukraine. Nothing is too difficult for our God. 2 Kings 19 recounts how the tribe of Judah faced with, was faced with an invasion of the Assyrian army, a ruthless and powerful force. In the natural, Judah was no, uh, was no match for them at all. But so Hezekiah, the king of Judah, put on sackcloth and ashes, went to the temple, sent for the prophet Isaiah, and humbled himself before the Lord. God delivered his people supernaturally by sending an angel into the Assyrian camp. He delivered his people. Judah didn't even have to fight the battle. The battle belonged to the Lord. If God can do it for his people Judah, he can do it for his people in Ukraine. But we do have to have God's strategy. And before we pray, I just want to read from 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be opened and my ears attentive to their prayers offered in this place. So God hears, he answers, and he tells us to come humbly but boldly to the throne of grace. Proverbs 21 says, The king's and ruler's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He directs it like a watercourse wherever he pleases. Nothing, nothing is impossible for our God. So as we uh, pray for the people in Ukraine, I'll just give you some pointers to prayer, and then we're all going to stand and pray together. God hears every one of our prayers. And as Steve Kemp so often says, God is not confused when we all pray together. He wants to hear each and every one of you. So we need to pray for the protection of you, the people for Ukraine. Um, the second largest city is, um, is half occupied uh, last night, uh, but Kiev is uh, still in the hands of the Ukrainian people. So let's pray that uh, God would put a restraining order on this invasion, that a bloodline would be drawn round the city of Kiev, that they would not be able to enter it, and that the people in their time of need would turn back to God and revival would break out in this country because our God is so powerful. He just wants us uh, to, to come to him and the battle belongs to the Lord when we come to him. God promises to keep in perfect peace those whose minds are fixed on him. So we pray for the people in Ukraine that they would have peace in this time of war. It's, it's, we can't even imagine what they're going through at the moment. And we ask for complete deliverance from evil, that they would once again be a free nation that depends on the true and living God. So can we all stand? And let's all pray together, and then I'll bring it to a close. So whatever the Lord lays on your heart. Oh, thank you. Strengthen them, yes, Lord. Uphold them with your righteous right hand, Father. And Father, we plead for a bloodline around that city, that the enemy would be restrained from coming over, that you would turn them in their tracks, that you would turn them back, Father. Turn the enemy back. And Father, that no weapon, no weapon formed against them would prosper. Father, we ask for wisdom for the Ukrainian pre president, for your protection over him. Thank you. Yes, Lord. 
Father, we thank you that you hear our prayers as we lift this nation to you. Have mercy, and by your grace we pray for your intervention in this situation, that the enemy will be defeated and turned back, that many will be saved, both physically and spiritually, and that in the midst of, their, of this war, revival would break out. We need you, Lord. They need you. May your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Glory to God. I'm going to pray for him. Jack's just prepared this word. We've looked at it together. And God's given him the message from heaven for you today. Thank you, Father. Father, we just pray your blessing on him. We pray your grace and your anointing as he brings this word to you directly from God himself to each and every one of us. We thank you, Father, for him and uh, bless him as he shares it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, good morning, church. You know I'm Jack. <laughs> it's an absolute privilege and a joy and a pleasure to be asked to share the word of God. And it's also a responsibility. So I pray that the Lord will speak and you will hear a message that will bless your heart and possibly make something change for the better. In 1 Timothy... 1 and 15, the Apostle Paul sums up the gospel of God's grace by saying, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And that's probably the only scripture in the whole of the Bible that I sometimes think, no, I am. <laughs> <laughs> but in Paul's defense, I wasn't born or conceived when he wrote that. Uh, yeah, the magnitude of the gift which St. Paul had, which he had gained in Christ, was best understood by Paul at the, against the backdrop of the um, utter state and dep depravity of his own, his own life, and he humbly accepted the, the uh, accolade of chief of sinners. Uh, 2 Samuel 4.4, we read about Saul, King Saul and Jonathan. Jonathan, son of Saul, had a son who was lame in both feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. His nurse picked him up and fled. But as she hurried to leave, he fell and became disabled. His name was Mephibosheth. I've given myself a right tongue twister for this morning, haven't I? <laughs> My title for the word this morning is The Fall and the Mephibosheth Syndrome. Mephibosheth was a man who should have and would have become the king of all Israel had things taken the natural term of events. His father was Jonathan and his father, we know, was King Saul, the first Israelite king. And King Saul was appointed and anointed by God through Samuel when the nation cried out to Samuel, give us a king. We want a king to rule over us. And of course, this was against God's superior judgment and against Samuel's better judgment when he said, if you have a king to rule and reign over you, he will tax you heavily. He'll commandeer all your strong young men, draft them into the army, and they'll have them fighting the, the battles and the king will uh, commandeer your property, commandeer your land and your, your riches and your possessions. And he will rule over you with an iron fist. And God, who is king, will rule over you gently, lovingly, mercifully, kindly. For his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Now... Saul was anointed king, but he lost his kingship in his death. 
he was killed in battle. And uh, at the news of this battle reaching Jerusalem, Mephibosheth's nurse panics and she takes him into a place called Lodibar. So my main scripture is in 2 Samuel and chapter 9, where we're going to look at the life of Mephibosheth. David asked, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show the kindness of God for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? At your service, he replied. The king asked, Is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show the kindness of God? And Ziba answered the king, There is still a son, a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both his feet. Where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, He is at the house of Machir, son of Amiel, in Lodibar. So King David had him brought from Lodibar, from the house of Machir, son of Amiel. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honour. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, what is your servant that you should take notice of a dead dog such as I am? Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I give your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. And Ziba said to the king, Your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's own sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah. And all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. He was lame in both feet. Here in chapter 9, we see David's display of God's loving kindness. The king asked, is there no one still alive? In verse 3, from the house of Saul, to who I can show God's kindness. And Ziba, one of Saul's servants, tells him about Mephibosheth. And according to 2 Samuel 4, 4, which I read at the beginning, Mephibosheth was only five years old when his father and his grandfather were killed in battle in the valley of Jezreel on Mount Gilboa. His nurse, we know, panicked and fearing their lives, fled, fled in a mad rush. Mephibosheth falls and injures his feet and becomes permanently lame. Now it's clear from 2 Samuel 9, 12 that some time has passed since Mephibosheth uh, became lame and broke his feet because when David calls him to the palace, Ziba brings to his, his attention uh, Mephibosheth and he has a young son himself called Micah so we know that now Mephibosheth is a younger man but several years after is becoming lame and breaking his feet and of course in those days if the king took over the kingship it was very common for the king to wipe out the remaining royal family in order to prevent an uprising in the future on the reclaiming of the throne and so Mephibosheth would have been terrified as he was approaching Israel's king, fearing for his life. But what happens next is completely unexpected. A total act of grace and love in order to show God's kindness. And in verse 9, King David restores all to Mephibosheth, which belonged to the house of Saul. All the land, all the livestock, all the property, all the possessions... This is what happens when a person turns from the sin in repentance and faith. This is what happens when Jesus accepts us into his kingdom. He became poor that we might become rich. And on the cross, Jesus took away all of our sin, all of our poverty. 
He gave us joy for ashes. By his stripes we are healed. And above all, the most amazing truth about the atonement is Jesus, the Messiah, became sin. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21 tells us that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. On the cross, Jesus took away all our sin, all our shame, all our guilt and all our sickness and poverty. And in return, he gives us his life, life eternal, abundant life. Just like Mephibosheth, he restores everything back to us. And above all, he restores fellowship with our Creator and with our Father. What has happened in the past is forgiven. He gives us a chance to start a new life again. The old life dealt with on the cross, and we become sons and daughters of the King in a relationship again with the King of Kings, relationship restored, and like Mephibosheth, like one of the King's own sons or daughters. Here we see an amazing parallel with the fall of Adam and the fall of man in the opening chapters of Genesis, which describes man's transition from innocent obedience to guilty disobedience when he eats of the tree of the knowledge of the, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and thus sets in motion God's plan of salvation and restoration for mankind and culminating in the reconciliation between God and man through the blood of Jesus' as atoning death on the cross. And fellowship is restored through the resurrection, resurrection life imparted to all true believers and repentant souls by the Holy Spirit. Just as Mephibosheth was destined to become the king and a royal heir in Israel, so humanity are destined for greater things than what have happened when God created the world. He saw that it was perfect and it, it was good and it pleased him. But just like Mephibosheth, mankind fell. And just as Mephibosheth broke his feet, mankind became lame, spiritually lame, unable to walk any longer with God in the garden paradise of Eden. We see... A picture of Adam and Eve, naked and ashamed, hiding from God in the Garden of Eden. And we look at Mephibosheth, who flees to a place called Lodibar. In the book of Joshua and 13.26 of Joshua, the place is referred to as Debur. It's the same place, just a variation on, on the name. But the word Debur means to be without pasture. It means no word. It means no communication. And so we see in Mephibosheth who is driven to a place of no word and no communication and no pasture. Mephibosheth is forced from the paradise of the royal palace to the ghetto town of Lodibar. Fallen, broken and lame for years. But then comes King David's amazing act of grace and love to show kindness, the kindness of God to Mephibosheth and Mephibosheth's unexpected response in verse 8 when he says what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me this is the response that we must acknowledge and come to a revelation that we like the like the wretches of John Newton's hymn Amazing Grace like Mephibosheth are a dead dog it's a bit hard to swallow I know but in our degenerate state we are useless to God unable to do anything on our own strength of any eternal value. When Mephibosheth said, I am a dead dog, he was acknowledging that without God, he was useless, no good, devoid of all good, utterly evil. And Jesus puts it like this in Matthew 7:11: If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask of him. And in John 8, 44, you belong to your father, the devil. And other scriptures teach us, Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And in Romans 3, 10, Paul quotes from the Old Testament, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one, which is from Psalm 53 and verse 3, everyone has turned away. All have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. 
Jeremiah tells us the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure who can understand it. And then to cap it all off in Genesis 6, 5, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The declaration of Mephibosheth that he is a dead dog is recognition that he is not deserving of the grace and the favor bestowed upon him by King David. In one of our praise songs, we declare that we wear royal robes we don't deserve. Psalm 103 and verse 10 says, he does not treat us according to our sins. He does not repay us according to our iniquities. There is nothing we could ever do to earn or ever deserve God's free gift of salvation and eternal life in Jesus Christ. There are no acts of charity, no good deeds or works, no well-intentioned motives or plans that will put us back into good standing before God. Isaiah 64, 6 declares that all have become broken like one who is unclean and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind our sins sweep us away. In Luke 18 and 11 to 13, Jesus tells us a parable of a Pharisee and a tax collector. The dictionary describes a Pharisee as, as one who is a right, self-righteous or hypocritical person. And when the people of Israel had to go and pay the temp, temple tax, they always held tax collectors in complete and utter contempt, for they were well known for their corruption the, the, the Pharisee and the tax collector parable Jesus tells us the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed thank you God that I am not like one of these other people robbers evildoers adulterers the list is endless <laughs> or even like this tax collector I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all that I get wow indeed good wow but the tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And in the following verses, justice is attributed by Jesus to the one who acknowledges that he is a sinner, who beats himself up because of his sin, and he cannot even bring himself to look heavenward, the one who agrees with Mithibosheth, I am useless like a dead dog. Luke 18, 14, Jesus responds, I tell you this man, that's the, the tax collector, rather than the other, the self-righteous, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. If any man or woman believes they are basically good and think that they can earn a place in heaven, then let them think again what the Lord has showed us in his word today. In Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not of your own works, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no man can boast. We were created to walk the path of life in fellowship with God, our Heavenly Father, in whose presence is fullness of joy and at whose right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 16, 11, you make me know the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. We were created to live in paradise, but like Mephibosheth, in the beginning and Adam and Eve, we fell. Conceived and born into sin, and like his lame feet, we were broken. And as he ran to hide in Lodibar, so we are far from God in our trespasses and sins. But just like King David, our King Jesus comes and he welcomes us back into his house. He invites us to sit at his table and he accepts us as his own adopted and chosen children. We are saved and changed from dead dogs, growing from glory to glory to be conformed into the image of his own dear son because of his sacrificial death on Calvary's cross. Because of his sacrificial death on Calvary, he forgives us. And because of his sacrificial death on Calvary, he restores us like Mephibosheth. 
and he justifies us and he will glorify us when he returns, when the Lord Jesus comes again. And in the word of David, in the shepherd Psalm 23, Psalm 23, 5 to 6, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He brings us into the kingdom. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. He gives us his Holy Spirit. Surely, goodness and mercy, like two shepherd dogs guiding us along the way, will follow me, keeping me on course. All the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. His kingdom, his church, the body of Christ, in his holy presence forever, life eternal. So we see that Mephibosheth shows us a picture of humanity, fallen, lost, and we see a picture of humanity restored by the king, reinstated into our, pos our position of glory in God's kingdom. And so this morning, are we ready to humbly to ask ourselves, do we recognize we are nothing without him? Unless the Lord builds a house, we labor in vain. Are we ready now at the start of this new week to commit ourselves to his service and, like King David, seek to find somebody to whom we might show the kindness of God. Somebody to love the unlovely and welcome the unworthy. And like King David, with Mephibosheth, welcome them with open arms and treat them as family. And if you have not received Jesus as your own personal Lord and Saviour, then this morning are you ready to do so? Are you willing to receive Jesus? This morning, if you wish to receive the Lord as your saviour, you haven't yet made that commitment, then speak to Pastor Steve or one of the elders or myself, and we will certainly tell you more of this good news. I pray that the Lord will bless his word to your hearts. Amen. What a precious word. What a great picture of us without God and us saved. Poor, wretched, lame, like a dead dog of no use to God. But David sent for Mephibosheth and God sent for you and I. And when we deserve judgment, he said no. Come and take all the lands of your grandfather Saul, David said to Mephibosheth. All his wealth, all his resources are now yours. And God says, all my wealth, my grace, my resources, my riches, my blessings are now yours. That's salvation. And as Jack shared so well, not only are we rich, and resourced and saved and equipped but we enter that personal relationship we sit at the table of the king in fellowship with him have you ever been at a very very precious meal at a table just with you and your loved one or your relative or your close close friend and at that table, you have fellowship together, one with another. But Mephibosheth sat at the table of the king as an equal. And today, incredibly, we sit at the table of the king of kings. One with him. Blessed and loved. And Mephibosheth sat at the king's table all his life, forever. That's where we are today. That's where you and I are today. So let's actually 
let go of the past. Let's let go of that old life. There was nothing there. There's nothing for us there now. Let's step away from it. Don't let it lay claims on us or haunt us or drag us down. Neither should we let it exalt us or distract us or entice us. The old life is gone. But we are new creations now. So if you're not in that place, please come and see me directly after this service. If you want to be that son of God, daughter of God, this is your time. But all of us who've taken that step, right now, we are at the table of the king. No better place ever. And we are royalty. Royalty. That is more powerful than any sickness, than any sin, than any doubt and any fear. That is the truth today. We are royalty. Let the Holy Spirit tell you that. Step away from the past and take your seat at the table of the King. For that is who we are, our identity in Jesus. I'm going to stand this morning in a minute. We won't do it just yet. I'm going to play, just play the guitar quietly. And uh, Jeanette on the keyboard. And while, because we've got time this morning. And while we play, I want you to do something in the presence of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> I want you to step away from that old life. The good and the bad. Step away. If you have to step up from it, because it was bad, step up. But step away from it. Of course, repent and confess any sin. But step away from it. Let it go. Let it go. That'll be the first part. And then the second part is to seat yourself at the table of the king. So we play. wilderness anymore you are not that dead dog anymore anything of self anything of our own efforts anything of our own pride just let that go just let that fall away but step away step away step away from hurt Step away from failure. Step away from the circumstances where you were dropped by someone else and, and damaged and hurt by them. Step away from the failure and the rejections. Step away from the feeling of being useless and no good to anyone. King sent for you, King Jesus, with such kindness. Let that go this morning, let it fall away. It doesn't define you, it doesn't shape you, it 
doesn't lead you You may have lived there but no more No longer You are not lame anymore No more And in a moment With an act of faith We're going to stand As we stand We rise above that old life We let go of that old life And we take our place As children of God Sons and daughters Of the living God there's healing, there's healing as you let go of that this morning. There's healing in stepping away from that dark past. There's healing today as you say, no, that's not where I live anymore. Arise, church. Arise, brothers and sisters. Arise, sons and daughters of the living God. Arise. Arise. God says, you're mine, you're mine, you're mine. I'm showing you kindness, says the Lord. I'm giving you all the resources, all the riches of heaven, restored to, back to you that I had for Adam. It's yours, it's yours today. I'm giving you, I'm giving you all, all that I have, says the Lord. And I'm calling you to sit at the table of the King. Will you take your place this morning? Yes, you are, you are chosen. Yes, you've been sent for. Yes, you're his. Not because of what you've done, but what Jesus has done. So will you take your seat at the table because of the power of the cross, because of the power of salvation? Will you take your seat as a, as a son, a daughter of the living God, sitting with the king? Jesus is right there. He says, come and sit by me. Come and eat my food. Come on now. Don't stay away. Don't hover. Don't stay in the shadows. Don't hide in the corner. Come on. Come and sit by me at my table. Can we do that? Can we do that? Can we do that? 